The way translations have been perceived has changed in the past few years, um, perceived by the industry, within the industry, by reviewers and award committees and readers. And I think Arunava has played an important role in this shift. Um, so over to you, Arunava, talk about your journey. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to start with a very quick um, statement or look at where we are today in India as far as translated literature is concerned. And it's a sort of a, a destination after 13 years for me and I'm one that I'm exceedingly happy to have arrived at. Um, in some very interesting way, in, in spite of, as, uh, of the fact that as Minakshi points out, individual translated titles may not be flying off the shelves. Over the past two or three years, Translated literature, that is translations from uh, one of the various languages in India in which literatures are composed into English, are reshaping what literature in English means in India. And I say this with no, I mean, I, I, I say this with, um, with surprise, because I really had hoped but not expected this to happen. But it is undoubtedly happening. The books that are written in the various languages, non-English languages of India, are of an entirely different kind, really, from those that are written in English. The ones that have been written in English come from sensibilities that are uh, coached and that are trained and that have um, acquired cultural inputs uh, from a very different kind of intellectual milieu, you know, a sort of um, um, Anglophone reading, uh, familiarity with the great works of literature written in English around the world, and perhaps a desire to be part of the same tradition. So uh, when you write in English in India, you wanted to be part of a great global tradition of English literature. And even if you were inspired by writers from India, such as Salman Rushdie and Amitav Ghosh and others, you still felt that your rightful place was on a global landscape. And therefore, you wrote to global sensibilities. But the languages of India, and there are at least a dozen languages in which there have been thriving, flourishing literatures for over 100 years now, which is no small measure when you consider that if you then take the political entity uh, of India as a country, you're talking about something like between 15 and 20 different literatures, all having produced books um, consistently for around 100 years now, and some even longer. So you can imagine what an enormous um, treasure trove of literature this is. And all of these literatures have been produced by writers writing in those particular languages for readers reading in those particular languages. And because India is organized um, in states mostly according to language, not entirely, but mostly, so you have also had geographical literatures, you know, geographical markets for particular literature, for example. So Tamil literature in India is, is almost entirely, if not 100%, uh, produced and read in the southern state of Tamil Nadu and the neighboring small union territory of Pondicherry. It is, of course, also read in among Tamil uh, speaking and reading people in countries such as Malaysia and Singapore, but primarily over there. Similarly, Malayali, Malayalam uh, literature is, is produced and written and sold and read primarily in the state of Kerala and so on. There are a number of other languages, each of which map onto particular geographies. So the markets uh, over there, and I'm using the word markets, although they were not thought of as markets, but the markets existed in those tight geographical spaces. But equally interestingly, um, before India became independent of British rule and the two countries of India and Pakistan were formed, which went on to become three countries in 1971 with Bangladesh breaking away from Pakistan. Before any of this happened, there was a very robust tradition of literatures being translated into the from one language into another within India. So. Bengali literature and Bengali also has this very interesting position in South Asia in that it is the language, primary language of the country of Bangladesh. Um, Rifat is here and Bangladesh is arguably the only country in the world which was formed on the basis of language. 
and its name indeed bangla stands for the language and and it was formed on a on a linguistic nationalism if i may call it that so bangla is a very very powerful element in in bangladesh obviously unlike many other countries where the standard drift is towards uh, many other parts of india where the standard drift is towards english bangladesh despite its inclusion of english into the cultural fabric has retained its focus on bengali in a very very strong way uh, bangla is also the primary language of the neighboring state neighboring to bangladesh that is of west bengal indeed the two were actually one state before independence and the partition of the country so uh, bangla or bengal as it was called then naturally they share the same language uh, so bengali literature has been written and read primarily in that part of the world and so on the northern half of the country there are, it cuts a large um, sweep across hindi speaking people so the language of hindi is the basis of literature there but even there we must remember that hindi is actually an artificial language created by the british for administrative purposes and actually it was various flavors that existed in local regions and in which literatures continue to be written but hindi in some way became a sort of lingua franca across that part of the country so all these literatures were being translated into one another uh, into the languages um, uh, up until independent the independence in 1947 or maybe slightly afterwards as well but after that in some way maybe um, because uh, uh, you know there was a need to foster education in the english language in order to attain certain global standards of training and learning and so on english gradually came into the ascendance and as a result people started spending more of their energies in learning english as their second language uh, rather than mastering another language from the country so while earlier you had people who were perfectly fluent in say uh, very geographically disparate languages like tamil and bangla and could thus translate into uh, these two languages the number of these people fell and gradually but upon by until the 1980s or 90s there was almost no one left who could do this and simultaneously books started getting translated into english now the first wave of translations into english from the various indian languages were done mostly by academic students they were done by college professors people who were researching deeply into in the indian literatures and as a result um those translations while they served the purpose of carrying texts across into english they were not always the most friendly thing for readers to read the objective was different the translators were very often protecting their academic reading of texts and trying to convey those in a new language in any case english language publishing in india up until the 1980s was a fairly nascent affair there were some companies but they were uh, not exactly mm, you know they, they, their books were not exactly the best books let's say and the english books that we read in india or maybe our parents generation read in india were books that were published abroad originally and then brought into india and read here so everyone read i don't know um lawrence and and uh, hemingway and steinbeck and they also read uh, translated literature copiously uh, one huge input over there was the fact that the russian uh government did enormous work in translating the russian masters into many languages of the world including not only english but many other indian languages as well and so many of us actually grew up reading a great deal of russian literature surprisingly or not as the case might be the books were very cheap and quite beautifully produced and many of us are quite nostalgic still about about the stories that we read so anyway um then in in the uh, 90s i think it was in the late 80s that the first multinational com- publishing company entered india english language publishing company entered india that was penguin uh, penguin books penguin books came in with a partnership with a media house inevitably a calcutta based media house uh, called anandavajar patrika and they formed a joint venture and they started out harper collins also then came in and formed a joint venture with another local publishing company named rupa and these were the two but penguin was really at the forefront of things penguin also then at that point had arguably the first and perhaps minakshi still the only superstar of publishing in india david davidar uh, who who led penguin india at a very young age and um, you know took it to very interesting places including publishing books such as those of vikram sets now um 
it was inevitable perhaps that the ground was now being set for an industrial strength push into translated literature into english and um, so my own entry in here is all is very serendipitous what happened was that i, I when i when in college in going to college in calcutta i was somehow and if you ask any translator around the world they'll tell you that they never quite know why or how they became translators but in college i was personally interested in translation for some obscure reason i'm not sure why um but i was and then i used to try my hand at translation now and then and then after um, i graduated from college we started a city magazine in calcutta which is where i'm from or they live in delhi now called calcutta skyline and they we used to publish one short story in translation in english every month in every issue and as a result of the stories we published there perhaps a, Beng- a very successful bengali writer who wrote under the pen name of shankar his full name is moni shankar mukherjee whose uh, seminal and and extremely well known novel is one named chorangi he asked me to translate chorangi for him into english i wasn't sure exactly why uh he said something about a french publisher being interested but wanting to read the uh, novel in english because they didn't have any bangla but anyway i was young and he offered me the equivalent of two months salary and i was just moving to delhi at that point and so i said yes and i translated it for him this was in the year 1992 i translated it for him i handed him a computer print out back in the old days when you had those accordion print outs you know on dot matrix printers i handed it to him i took my the 6000 rupees that he gave me 6000 indian rupees which was as i said two months salary at that point and helped me uh, move to delhi and and pay the deposit on my rented house and i moved to delhi and and it kind of slipped my mind occasionally when i would have uh, these periods of angst and ennui i would think about going back to translation but it never quite materialized now cut to 2006 14 years later 14 years later i suddenly get a call uh, i must tell you another thing which is that um, uh, at initially at least almost all not all but many of the editors and publishers at english language publishing companies whose numbers by now had swelled to more than penguin because penguin was there but harper collins was now a full fledged affair and other companies had come in hashat had come in i think by then minakshi and um, upper collins was on its own and bigger although it still had a uh, then had a uh, joint venture going with the india today media group <laughs> and there were others coming in anyway so one and all the most of the editors or many of the editors and publishers were in fact from calcutta and bengalis as it bengali speaking people as it happened uh, some kind of natural movement towards um, publishing i think um, call it a racial failing if you like <laughs> anyway so um they were very familiar as a result with bangla literature and when when the thought of translations came i think somebody suggested that we need to produce more books basically and there are not enough books being written in english so what do we do and someone said well obviously then let's translate books from the indian languages these are tried and tested books they've been around for many years they've already been sold in large numbers so why are we not going to translate them so uh, dia kaur hajra uh, dia kaur who was a senior editor at penguin decided that she would publish chorangi in translation david david had already published two other magnum opuses by a bengali writer named sunil gangopadhyay those days and first light and they'd been extremely successful so it was chorangi's turn and then dia spoke to shankar who said look i already have a translation somebody did it 14 years ago i forgot his name but here it is and he handed her the the typewritten the computer print out and the smartest thing i ever did was putting my name on that print out so and because calcutta is essentially a village and pretty much everyone knows everyone so dia uh, my was familiar i mean she knew me and she the, was familiar with the name so she called me and that was how chorangi was published so i really feel that even though it was done in 92 the time was right i mean you know it could not possibly have been published up until that time when there was this whole move towards publishing the literatures of india and i think bangla was at the forefront initially for various reasons many bengali writers were already household names uh, for different reasons um the editors were, were they knew their bangla literature well but um, while the first wave was a lot of bengali books we soon had books coming in from malayalam from tamil then from marathi and hindi of course subsequently it spread to kannada telugu gujarati 
and now we see books from odia as well which is great other flavors of uh, of hindi um assamese and so on so now it has become um in in the over the next 10 years i would say between 2007 till about 2015 you couldn't really produce enough translations publishers were very very hungry for them they wanted more books more books more books give us whatever you've got and there weren't enough translators at that point um, it's still a difficult profession to get into because you're never quite sure why you become a translator it's certainly not going to earn you a living to sustain you it's going to get you a certain amount of uh, renown in a small circle and now of course if you're really really lucky and good you will get some um, some uh, prizes as well which are a reasonable amount of money but really for a, pub, a translator from india to make any serious money from translations it would have to be by selling rights to companies abroad to publishers abroad anyway but that i'm jumping ahead uh, so uh, you know there was a huge demand and and publishers across the line were then talking to me and saying what do you have can you give us something and so for me it was like i was just uh, about to hit my midlife crisis and instead of that red ferrari or some other equally uh, stupid decision i saw that this was a good way to sustain myself and not have an emotional breakdown so i i i hit hit the ground running with translation and then the big joy was that there were other people joining in from other languages so you know people like jerry pinto came in from marathi and kirti ramachandran came in from kannada and marathi as well and uh, there was uh, Gillian Wright who had already worked on Sheila Shukla from Hindi and and a whole bunch of people their books started coming it was it was tremendous it was tremendous and in a way i think the english language writers also started reading these books and also started seeing that they the 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 areas and fields and the kind of people they could write about i was actually much larger than people who inhabit your own drawing rooms So in a sense, Vikram said had done that already. Vikram said was never he wasn't writing about people who were only in stratified atmospheres, but many others tended to write, you know, about about small spaces. Very write very well, but in some way they didn't have that um, um, earthy quality, if I may say so. Now. after the mid 2000 from about 2015 onwards i think the realization that minakshi spoke of which is that hey translations are all very well but you know what they don't really sell all that much and uh, so that realization began to dawn and there this we had this joke translators had this joke that uh, which minakshi you may know or may not know or will be mortified to hear that every time an editor presented a translation at a at an editorial at an acquisition meeting and insisted on publishing a translation the sales head would go and leave because they said like i can't sell this book so i'd better not be around that would be out. me present <laughs> i know that's very mean but that was a as i said it was a joke um well i'm not sure if it's entirely a joke but okay but uh, it's true that uh, i think at some point um, it was also the time i think when um, and it wasn't just translation i think it was a time when fiction itself english language fiction itself started facing competition from other means other vehicles for literature films became sharper many tv series became sharper and of course we know that over the past 3 or years or so over the top plat- ott platforms have become a very serious vehicle for literature we are not just talking about adaptation but they are really literary in their own right um but you know through all this while this is the sort of top layer in the sense of having national presence in, in the form of english language publishing the indian language publishing systems were as robust and thriving as much as ever there was absolutely no letting up over there writers were writing books were being published in large numbers and people were reading and buying buying them and reading them in large numbers and that continued and as a result writers in bangla or tamil or malayalam or kannada had no problem finding readers now they operated on a slightly different scale for example a typical edition of a book in a non english language is 1000 copies so it's more modest than the 2000 or 3000 that english language publishers aim for but the fact is that you're talking about an audience that is also a fraction of the size of the english reading population of india and one it, the economics were such that if you sold out an edition of 1000 copies you were actually in good shape uh, 
and this i'm talking about india in bangladesh the numbers are vastly different uh, rifat i believe uh, it is said in india with some uh, degree of envy that uh, publishers in bangladesh are among the richest people in that country i don't know if that's entirely true or not but uh, their wealth is measured in in how many cars they have rifat but be that as it may bangla publishing in bangladesh really is a different ball game and it is it is actually very very robust and powerful but in india at any rate um all these languages were thriving and so not only were they thriving for publishers they were also thriving spaces for writers and writers were now writing books which were actually quite amazing because they not only continue to retain their roots and their own traditions to the literatures in their own language they were also avidly reading what was becoming available from world literatures and the trend had started from the 1990s but in the 2000s with the advent of all the multinational publishers we also had a huge influx of books published in other parts of the world coming into india and becoming available and we also had big ticket retailing book retailing for the first time you know we had these large very large mega stores uh, stocking books and books were no longer limited to ori those originally published in english but as a writer you were reading books originally written in japanese in in spanish in portuguese in some african languages in the nordic languages all of these being translated into english and becoming available so it was really a golden era and it continues to be in a sense golden era for writers because their inputs were coming in from all over um at the so literary traditions were very rich now what has happened really the perhaps the best thing that has happened in the past 5 years is the emergence of translators there are now translators working from many different languages in, and i'm talking about translators writing in translating into english uh, translators have emerged in india and what is even more wonderful perhaps in some ways is that translators have emerged from the indian diaspora living abroad so now you have people who live in the us and the uk who obviously have one of the indian languages as their mother tongue who are now working directly from let's say a tamil or a, or a kannada or a bangla or a hindi into english and their english is actually of a kind that is already you know it it sounds global and is global it is not even a particularly indian in its in its um, flavor so given that there is this huge now space of translators it is natural that even if the number of translated books has in some way gone down per publisher but i would not say that the total number of translated books has gone down because many more publishers have jumped into the translation game and this is very heartening because it's no longer just the multinationals who are publishing translations you have smaller publishing firms across the country who are publishing translations from very often from the languages um of the geographies that they are located in so you have a small company from calcutta also publishing translations from bangla into english you have a small company from uh, delhi publishing translations from hindi into english and so on so as a result although each publishing company perhaps because of economic reasons is publishing fewer translations if you count the number of translations that come out their number has actually gone up what is even better is that the best books are now getting discovered in the, again initially in the first 10 to 15 years it was more a question of looking at the classics but once the once and the classics are by no means exhausted but the obvious books from most languages have already been translated into english so now people are looking at modern and contemporary works and that to my mind is what is really brought about the change it is the fact that contemporary books are being discovered and being translated into english that has completely changed the literary landscape of english uh, literature in india so the jcb prize for example which is um, which is now in its third year in three years the prize has gone to translated books on two occasions which i think is remarkable by any standards right both both the books were written originally in uh, malayalam and then translated into english very interestingly in both cases the translators do not live in india shanaz habib who translated benjamin's book lives in the us and jaisi kalathil who translated s sadish's absolutely mind blowing book a uh, novel named uh, mustache lives in the uk and um, writers who were originally considered to be on the fringes are actually moving to the center 
So Monoranjan Bapadi being one example. Monoranjan Bapadi is a Dalit writer uh, from from um, West Bengal, from Bengal. He is um, he has lived the most extraordinary life, which he has written about, and his his um, autobiography has been published. One volume has been published, and the second one is coming up. And he has converted many of his first-hand and second-hand experiences into the most amazing novels. Now these novels owe nothing to formal literary traditions. They do not come out of any reading of world literatures or how books should be written or anything, but they're written from the gut. They are written in a raw, powerful, and extremely urgent language, which does not keep any artifice between the reader and the content. So as a reader, you are exposed to all the dirt and blood and grit and everything that is happening in those novels. And really, I think English language writers who are reading this are themselves becoming transformed in the process. They're realizing that they also need to get much closer to people, much closer to their to their realities and 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 perhaps drop some of the polish and and become more raw and and um keep the rough edges in order to tell a better story of the of the world that they inhabit. <clears throat> if we look at the writers, the other part that has come in is that we are discovering an extraordinary, and I keep using that word, but really I don't have another word for it, extraordinary inventiveness in writing. If you look at some of the books that are coming out of Malayalam, many of which Minakshi has published, it's amazing. You know, there's there's um, Chora Shastra, for example, which, which uh, you know, it's a it's a book where um, an ancient work which which uh, who's, who, which supposedly teaches the art of thievery is discovered, and somebody picks it up and starts applying the science and arts in the in a modern day world. Or there's another book in which there is a cock which grows, but nobody has ever seen that cock. But this cock keeps growing all the time. So th these and these stories are playing havoc with. Um, with the way the Western canon constructs its books. They're completely destroying all those structures and they're bringing in myths, they're bringing in fables, they're bringing in real life characters. And the imagination has such enormous play over here that there is little to no attempt to try and pin it down within the five senses of that can um, absorb what is going on in the world around you. So as a result, uh, sometimes even the English language is inadequate in being able to capture all that is going on. Uh, you know, sometimes the translations actually fall short, not because of the translators, but simply because the language does not have the kind of inventiveness and the kind of um, multifaceted qualities that you need to get all these across. So I'm going to, I think my, our half an hour is up. So I'm going to end here by just saying that we are perhaps living in the most exciting times in term, in the way in which we are discovering the multiple literatures of India through translation. And perhaps the only thing that now remains is really for these books to be translated into other languages of India as well, which is a huge challenge.